and welcome to another episode of Curious Collections from the Benson Memorial Library. I'm sure many of you are somewhat familiar with Ben Hogan, the self-titled wickedest man in the world who plied his various trades in the oil region in the 1860s and 70s. There's been more than one book written about him, a few of which he contributed to directly. His character appears in a stage play called Melba, the Toast of Pit Hole, as well as the Pit Hole Lantern Tours. There was even a restaurant in Titusville's Drake Mall called Hogan's Palace, complete with a room called the Pit Hole Pit. A person could spend years picking apart the dozens of stories about this scoundrel, trying to separate fact from fiction. For today, though, we'll just take a quick peek at the story of one of the most notorious residents of Pit Hole. Let's dig in. Accounts mostly agree that Benedict Hagen, not Hogan yet, was born in Württemberg, Germany in 1841 and emigrated with his family to New York State. His father was a cabinet maker and eventually set up shop in Syracuse. It's also safe to say that young Ben was a bit of a troublemaker and spent some time in reform school before leaving home for good around age 15. At this point, we're somewhat dependent on Ben himself for details of how he spent the next several years. His biography, The Life and Adventures of Ben Hogan, the Wickedest Man in the World, written by George Francis Trainer and published in 1878, is a rip-roaring read, but probably best taken with a large grain of salt. In the preface, Trainer says, the writer himself would be very loath to lay claim to any of the brilliant wit or delicacy in the choice of subjects which may be found in this book. The honor of all these belong exclusively to Mr. Hogan. This, coupled with regular references to our hero sprinkled throughout the book, as well as the unusually dense amount of hijinks crammed into a short number of years, means one would be wise not to take the book as gospel. With that disclaimer, here's a significantly edited rundown of how Ben claims he spent the decade prior to his arrival in Pit Hole. First, he makes his way from Syracuse to New York City and takes a job as a cabin boy on the sailing ship Humboldt. He spends two years as a cabin boy before stumbling on a gymnasium during a shore leave and proceeding to fall massively in love with the sport of boxing. He quits the ship and throws himself into fighting and spends some time sparring under the title Sailor Boy. He then returns to Syracuse to open a boxing room. After this, he takes the proceeds from the boxing room, eventually makes his way south, and loses most of his money while gambling in New Orleans. Shortly after this, he meets a man who offers him a job, and he ends up acting as a blockade runner and pirate outside Charleston, South Carolina. He then claims to have taken over the ship from the pirate captain and spends six months being a pirate captain, eventually ending up with $50,000 in his pocket, and then makes his way to New York City, where he promptly loses all of it. He spends some time after this bounty jumping, and uh, also at the time took a job as a tra with a traveling show as a prize fighter and strongman, touring several states throughout the South and near Washington, D.C. He claims that at this time he was also working as a spy for both the Confederate and Union armies. An acquaintance then tells him about the money to be made in the oil fields of western Pennsylvania. At this point, Pit Hole in 1866 is a bustling place, boasting roughly 15,000 residents, the third busiest post office in Pennsylvania behind Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, and a local newspaper, the Pit Hole Daily Record. This would be an attractive spot for someone like Ben looking to make a dollar. At this point, Ben is approximately 24 years old. A description of him from his biography states, In height, Ben, ben stands about 5 feet 8 inches. Ordinarily, he weighs 185 pounds. He's exceedingly well built, straight as an arrow. He has a chest which would do honor to Apollo, while his shoulders are broad enough for another atlas. He dresses neatly, sometimes elaborately, but never in flashy taste. Meeting him upon the street in his usual dark clothes with the silk hat and cane which he invariably carries, one might take him to be a successful businessman or a thriving lawyer or possibly a sensational preacher. Perhaps the words shameless self-promoter should have been added to this description as well. Here the paper trail begins to pick up again. In February of 1866, the Pit Hole Daily Record ran an advertisement for a show at the Athenium Hall featuring the German Hercules Professor Hagen and his celebrated troupe of athletes and gymnasts. Cost 50 cents admission. 
One of the attractions of the show was seeing Hagen lie on the floor of the stage when an, while an 800 pound stone was laid on his chest and then broken by his assistants. Ben spent less than a year in pit hole, but it was a busy time indeed. A week after the Athenium show, he began advertising sparring and gymnastics lessons. Evidently, there wasn't sufficient interest in that to keep the money rolling in, so he pivoted to selling beer, and Ben Hogan's Lager Beer Saloon was born. Ben's establishment was located on First Street, the red light district of pit hole, and in close proximity to two other notable houses. The Florence Restaurant, run by Emma Fenton, where Ben claims to have been the business manager and supposedly raised the establishment from being a one-horse operation to a $100 a day business, as well as French Kate's Place. Here's another e excerpt from The Life and Adventures of Ben Hogan. Although Ben had made M. Fenton's house his stopping place, he left there owing the woman $6. He next joined French Kate, a notorious character with whom Ben was associated for a considerable time. This woman had served as a spy in the Confederate Army and had been a companion of J. Wilkes Booth, Surratt, and others. In connection with Kate and Fanny White, he opened a first-class house where liquors were served by pretty waiter girls and where the patrons very soon became quite numerous. This is another point where Ben's telling of the story and others seems to differ. The pit hole record detailed a raid on several brothels that occurred in June of 1866 and specifically mentions that the house owned by French Kate and Fanny White was raided and the ladies fined. It also mentions that Bully Ben was in the building, but there's no mention of him being arrested, fined, or otherwise held accountable for the doings within the house. Uh, the local Methodist preacher, a Reverend Darius Stedman, writes that at one time Ben was soliciting girls to work at Kate's place by posting advertisements in newspapers suggesting a position for young girls who would be working in a private home with a nice family. One young lady from the Buffalo area who made the mistake of accepting the position was being held at French Kate's against her will, but managed to slip out a, a letter to her mother who came looking for her. The mother went to Reverend Stedman to look for help in getting her back, and Reverend Stedman, a Civil War veteran, managed to enlist three of his army friends to des descend on French Kate's, loaded with pistols, and to force Ben at gunpoint to let the girl go. Now, in between Ben's time at various houses of ill repute and running his sparring house slash saloon, he was also keeping his hand in at prize fighting. In March of 1866, at which point he started going by the name Hogan rather than Hagen, the paper mentions a sparring match between Professor Hogan and the equally notorious Stonehouse Jack. It appears Hogan won the fight since Jack challenged him to a rematch with or without gloves for a $250 purse. The next month, April, there was a prize fight which took place in Ball Town outside of Pit Hole between Hogan and J.H. Holiday of New York, where Hogan soundly beat Holiday in front of a crowd of approximately 800 people in eight rounds. The month after that, someone named Tom Elliott, who had previously served as Ben's second during the fight with Holiday, arrived in town from Oil City with the express purpose of picking a fight with Ben. Here, the newspaper says, Hogan, who is represented as a quiet, inoffensive person for his class and disposed to be peaceable, beat Elliott soundly in five rounds and then turned himself over to the police while Elliot had to be carried off to a hotel to have his wounds looked after. In June of 1866, there was a massive fire on First Street, which actually took out Ben Hogan's beer saloon. While he stayed in town for a short time after this, by the end of the year, he had pulled up stakes and went on to other adventures. His biography mentions a brief stint running a dance hall in Babylon outside Titty Ute with French Kate. He then operated a floating gambling casino on the Allegheny River between Parker and Pittsburgh, which eventually sank. He lost a fight against the heavyweight champion bare knuckle boxing champ Tom Allen, and gradually worked his way back to New York City, where in 1878 he had a major conversion. The so-called wickedest man in the world saw the light and got religion and went on an evangelization tour across the country, preaching about temperance and encouraging people to give up their wicked ways in an extremely colorful manner. 
He finally settled in Chicago, Illinois, and spent the last decades of his life running a soup kitchen and shelter for the homeless. He died in November of 1916, just shy of his 75th birthday. Now, was Ben Hogan truly the wickedest man in the world? Did he just have an incredible gift for self-promotion and storytelling? No matter the answer, it certainly makes for a great tale. If you'd like to read the rip-roaring version of this story as dictated by Ben himself, you can find The Life and Adventures of Ben Hogan by George Francis Trainer on the Project Gutenberg website or at Amazon.com. For a slightly more factual view of the activities that happened during his time at Pithole, there is a chapter in William C. Dara's book, Pithole, The Vanished City, that is available for checkout here at the library. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If there are other Titusville-related history topics you'd like us to explore, please feel free to drop a note in the comments below. Until next time, we'll see you in the stacks. Bye-bye now.